Hey, it's Kellen. And of course, AO. And today on Diversified Game, we're going to go take an inside look of a PR czar, our former PR czar, a friend of ours who's done blogging, writing. She has a media list that you want if you're a publicist. She also has connections from the United States all the way to Africa because she writes for all type of publications, including OK Africa, The Grio. She's the managing editor. She also has so many other things that she's doing. Darylin Hudson, how are you doing? I am wonderful. Thank you. And I, I want to make sure I'm pronouncing your name right. Kellen, correct? That is, that is right. Kellen and A and A L. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. And, 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 and Thank today, you having... you're, you're welcome. You're welcome. We want you to kind of tell us um, your story for all the people listening who say, wait, she's a writer. She's a blogger. She gets paid to do this. Give us your journey on how you got here and the different places that you've been. Yes. Um, I get paid to read and write. That's what I get paid to do. <laughs> And and I do other things for fun, too, but I'm a proud journalist. I started um, as a journalist right out of college. I went to Spelman, and my first job was at Upscale Magazine. Shout out to Bernard Bronner and Sheila Bronner over there, Upscale. Um, that was my first job. I was an administrative assistant at Upscale Magazine. <laughs> um, so I kind of came up with, a lot of, uh, I would say, hip hop journalists. We loved talking about music. We loved um, kind of talking about film, but we were really wrapped up in 90s hip hop. <laughs> and um, that's kind of how I started my career. I started my career as a hip hop journalist. Um, from there, I worked a lot at the stores. I worked a lot, at, I worked at Vibe. I kind of did my rounds of, uh, the hip hop publication and um, became a really, you know, a working journalist. My hashtag is life of a working journalist. That's, that's uh, what I did for a very, very long time. And that's, you know, that has been the income that has sustained me, that has uh, paid my bills. So uh, first and foremost, I am a proud journalist. Thank you for asking. <laughs> but not just a journalist. I mean, you have taken it, to even another level where, you know, I mean, I think all journalists at some point venture off into PR or managing, but you've done it internationally. Um, can, you, can you talk about, you know, how you started and then how did you go international with it? Well, that's a really big leap because I've been doing this for over 25 years. So um, every I kind of came up in the same realm of people like uh, Kieran Mayo, the people that, the, the ladies that created Honey. Uh, remember Vanguard Media? Remember Honey? Remember Heart and Soul? Yeah. Uh, Lambernet was one of my first, Lambernet was one of my first, um, uh, he, he was one of the first people that gave me an opportunity to, to really write and to delve into what it, what it was that I wanted to do. Um, Keith Clink Scales, who's also a, a well-known publisher, well-known black publisher. He is my mentor. So I I came up with um, you know, kind of a group of publishers, a group of people that really loved print. You know, they loved magazines. And I came up with them. And we have had to learn to evolve, <laughs> you know. Some people have gone into TV, uh, some people have gone into um uh, publishing, some people have gone, you know, you kind of go your own way because once you, you know, once you start in your 20s and you're writing and you're kind of, you know, doing the celebrity thing and traveling the world and, you know, meeting all kinds of people, by the time you're in your 30s, you're burnt out. You're like, okay, what am I going to do next? <laughs> How am I going to continue to evolve? And um, my evolution kind of went a couple of different ways. Um, I published my own magazine after a few years of doing it, I went into, um, I was very interested in film, so I worked with DT and MTV for a while, um, got older and decided to uh, go into fashion. I really love fashion. And there was an area where I really thought black voices were missing. So 
um, Italian Vogue gave me an opportunity to kind of see the world. And it's, it's really allowed me to tell really, really great stories about really amazing people. So um, you can't just kind of lump journalism into one, you know, one category anymore. It, it, I did a documentary on Langston Hughes about 10 years ago, and he was one of the first people that kind of taught me that um, being a writer is um, like an onion. <laughs> There's so many layers, you know. <laughs> There's so many layers. But it, it all it all really does stem from my passion for for writing and telling great stories. Um, yeah. <laughs> I hate to talk about PI because that's the least of what I like to do. I form relationships with editors and um, those relationships have kind of yielded some really uh, great access. <laughs> that's what we're talking about. Okay, that's that's phenomenal, Diane. <laughs> Sounds I can get to anybody. I mean, I've been I've been writing for 25 years, so there's no editor at any magazine that I can't get to. So I'm gonna put that out there, people. <laughs> they might always say they might not always say yes, but I can get to them. Okay, solid, solid, solid. Now, in in terms of um, over over the years, in terms of uh, your writing, uh, what are some of the uh, the types of stories or some of the features or that you've covered over the years? Um, I've been really excited about uh, what I've been doing for the last five years, which is focusing on my niche in fashion. You know, fashion is very broad. As, as you know, PR is very broad. You kind of, uh, after you've been doing it for a few years, you really want to uh, have a name for yourself. You want to leave, leave something behind. And I started forming relationships with stylists, costume designers, when I would work on film sets, so when I would write about film launches, film releases. And it's so funny because I look at uh, a Netflix show like uh, Jason Bolden and um, him and his husband, you know, kind of follow them around. And I said, wow, you know, I cannot take uh, responsibility for that show, but I was a part of the wave of giving stylists, <laughs> you know, some shine. And um, that was my, that became my niche. I started to talk to black costume designers, black stylists, and realizing that they were celebrities in themselves. They were influencers, you know, within themselves. So um, I did a series for Italian Vogue where we, we interviewed um, stylists, especially stylists that had been working with artists for many, many, many years, people like E.J. King that's been working for Chris Brown for like 15 years, or um, at the time, um, I don't know if you know, but uh, Jermaine Hill, who I've been working with Prince for many years, and um, these were just really fantastic personalities, and I was able to do a series um, for Italian Vogue. And it was the bomb diggy, because working for Vogue obviously gets you in a whole lot of doors. <laughs> That you didn't even know existed in the fashion area. So, yeah, you know, that's, I'm really proud of those profiles that we were able to do for um, all kinds of stylists. I mean, some that you know, some that you don't know. So, yeah. So, so would you say, like, like fashion is definitely where, where your heart is at? That's where you're most passionate about? Uh, that's what you like um, uh, crafting? Uh, the best stories or pieces around around uh, would that be fashion? Um, I don't really like to say that I am monolithic because I'm not. Um, I like to tell really great stories. I get excited when I'm learning something new. When someone introduces something to me that I had never heard of before, I never knew before. Um, I'm really excited about telling stories in really creative ways. And I know that's vague because everybody is a storyteller, right? Everybody's a storyteller. But um, I really pride myself on that. And sometimes it's in print. Sometimes it's in video. Sometimes it's in um, getting two people together to have a conversation. It really depends, you know, what has really been great about being able to live to 2020 
is that I can tell stories in a million different ways, but, you know, um, I've learned to get paid from it. So that's what's different now than what was happening when I first started. <laughs> no, that's... L yeah, let's talk. About, yeah, let's let's talk about that. I, I was listening to your last interview, and you mentioned that she was worth a billion a million dollars. I was like, damn. I mean, you said something about a billion, and you were talking to. I was like, wow. I want to have that conversation. Yeah. Well, well, and and that's the type of conversations we like to have. And that was the rumor. And she she's not, but that's what the on you know online can say a lot of things. And she has. It doesn't a, even matter. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. even matter that it's that she's not. You didn't have to say that. That don't even matter. But the fact that somebody put that out there. Yeah. Yeah, but we've all had clients where, you know, they say they're worth X amount of millions and you're like, wait, why am I getting paid this? I should be getting paid that, right? And and and, <laughs> and, 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 and what we try to do on Diversified Game is give an insight of, you know, like all these things that you are talking about doing are based on relationships. What was the first job that you got to establish these relationships? Because one builds upon many, but and how did you get it? And 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 were you qualified for that job? Or you know, I just want people to kind of understand how does someone like yourself, like myself, like AL get their start? Because that's one of the biggest questions for people who are you know from college to high school to middle school. How do you get your start? How did you get your start? So <laughs> I've had maybe three or four starts. <laughs> so I'm gonna I wanna talk about the first two. I could even I can even tell you about the first three, but my very first start was again at, at Upscale Magazine. Um Upscale Magazine is a publication that's out of Atlanta, Georgia. It's a monthly. They're not as big as they used to be, but you know, they have been around for a long time and, and it's started by a black family in Atlanta. They're like black Atlanta royalty, the Bronner brothers, and um, they started a magazine. They they had a lot of, you know, they were a wealthy family. And Bernard Bronner and his wife Sheila started a magazine in the basement of their house. And they lived in a big, beautiful mansion, um, and they started a magazine. It's called Upscale. Sheila is a graduate of Spelman, and um, I knew that I wanted to get in the magazine business. I knew that I wanted to. Um, stay in Atlanta because I'm from Detroit, but I fell in love with Atlanta when I went to school and I wanted to stay there. The only way my mom was going to let me stay there is if I had a job. So um, I heard that she was looking for an assistant. I think it, it was an admin job at the time. And um, I bombarded her with phone calls and she, until she set up an interview. After the interview, I bombarded her with calls and um, letters and gifts. I think I even sent her cookies at one time, but it was over maybe a four-month period until I got that job. And she, I credit <laughs> Sheila for showing me how to use a freaking mouse at the time. I think I had had one computer class, but she showed me how to use the mouse. She showed me how to formulate an article. She taught me how to interview. Um, she taught me how to behave around celebrities. Um, she taught me like a lot. <laughs> um, my second beginning was with Anselm Samuel, who is now the director of content at Complex, but at the time he was an entertainment editor at the store. Um, and he asked me this. I don't know why I chose him. But I think it was something about his name because I used to, I'm, a, I'm an avid magazine reader and I kind of look for interesting names because I have an interesting name. My name is Daryl and it's been like the date of my existence. But he had an interesting name and I wanted to target someone that I thought I could engage with. And at that time, editors, you know, sat in their offices and they answered their phones and emails. And Anthony was somebody, he was an editor that answered his phone. And I called Anselm constantly, and I was like, dude, I want, you know, I, I knew I wanted to be a national freelance writer. Like, I knew that in my head, that's what I wanted to do, and I pitched, I constantly pitched content, pitch, 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 and he and I formed a relationship through those calls because he, he was like, no, nah, I can't do that, but try this, or, you know, he helped me. 
And he was the best editor I've ever had. My first article was the Acapulco Black Film Festival. And he allowed me to write a 500-word article. That was like my first national piece. I got paid $400. I was like, ow! So that was it for me. I knew that I, yeah, I was like, okay, so this is how it works. I could do this. <laughs> um, okay, last and final story. Well, not final story, but my first uh, gig in TV um, was with a sister called Tiffany Williams. She's an executive producer over at, I think she's at MTV now. But Tiffany was the first black woman that I knew made six figures in TV. She was an associate producer on, oh, God, what was the name of the show? It was like uh, Climbs Invaders, one of those reality shows where they would punk people, they would uh, surprise people. So Tiffany was looking for a production coordinator. I had no idea what a production coordinator was. I had um, decided to do it. Anselm had talked me into doing a documentary on Langston Hughes, which I did. And I was living in New York at the time off of doing that movie. Um, because I sold it and, you know, had a little money. So um, I don't know who introduced me to Tiffany, but at the time, Tiffany was trying to bring somebody on her team that was black. She saw my resume that I went to Spelman, and she had a call with me, and she hired me on the spot as a production coordinator. And I ended up working at BET and MTV in the uh, Viacom family for six years. So, and she actually took me over to TV One, so I followed her like for a good six or seven years, <laughs> living in New York, uh, working my ass off. So I've had three starts, um, but they've all been by my connections with somebody black or a black college, or um, it's always black for me. So anytime you're talking about diversity, uh, diversity means everything and everything to me in my career. Solid, solid, solid. Now, uh, Darylin, with um, it's like the piggyback on connections and uh, the stories that you've written and uh, the documentaries, um, are there any plans to uh, develop TV shows or develop more movies uh, based on uh, your relationships and just your skill and expertise? Um. <laughs> Uh, yes. Yes, there are plans. Um, a good friend of mine, Melissa Miller, is, is kind of blasphemous, and I don't know if I should, I don't even know if I should tell this story because she would, I'm not even going to say her, let me not say her name. A good friend of mine is producing, um, wrote, wrote, or worked with a writer to do a Netflix movie. The Netflix movie, her agent has got it into the hands of Queen Latifah, and they want to do it. But uh, Queen Latifah wants to work with a black director, and my friend is not black, so she thinks she's going to be taken off of. She's on pins and needles right now because she thinks they want to get rid of her. <laughs> uh, but I was consulting on this movie. We we actually helped to really tell the story of what this movie is about. I can't say it. Um, Nikki Gilbert, I could definitely talk about her. Nikki Gilbert, another Detroit homegirl that was the executive producer of R&B Divas on TV One, um, is doing a series of TV shows um, for uh, a network out of Atlanta. And I plan to be working with her because she and I talk a lot about ideas. She bounces her TV ideas off of me. Um, so, yeah, it's always in the works. I mean, if anyone that works in the field that I work with, um, you have a lot of balls in the air. So all of my balls are really revolved around really great storytelling. It's just, you know, wonderful that we have so many mediums by which to tell these stories. But, yes, there are plans. Okay, excellent, excellent, excellent. We'll definitely keep an eye out for sure. Yeah, and and talk about your your media list. The I almost don't want to say it because in nowadays, like it could be it could be you know ten years later, and they say Kellen said, but this is the name, Big Fat Media Guide. Talk about the Big Fat Media Guide and the benefit that that can have for those publicists, especially you younger publicists who are still learning and still trying to build your connections and maybe, you know, don't have everything together, but 
you're, you're working at it. Talk about that and, and what inspired that. Well, it was something that as a journalist, um, well, really not as a journalist, but my time in LA was spent working with another Selma sister. She and I were actually roommates. Um, she went into the direction of PR. Her name is, I, don't, I shouldn't say her name, Natasha Wynn Griggs. <laughs> But, uh, you know, she's a powerhouse in PR. She's been doing it for a really long time, and she's over at – she was a TV one, but I don't know where she's at now. That's a good question. I need to find out. But I went to L.A. to work with Tasha, and Tasha did PR for uh, the Queen Latifah show. She was handling all the accounts at Bounce TV. She was handling a few CBS shows. I mean, she had a really great clientele of TV. Um, one of my responsibilities was to handle and update this really massive database. And it's one of those things that you do when you come into an, uh, an agency. It's like one of those grunt works. You have to, there's a massive database. It has uh, everything from print media to uh, women's, uh, women's media. We have LA TV, uh, LA radio. It, it was so massive that it was completely overwhelming, but after you've been there for three months, you know, you start to kind of get in the groove. And one of the things that I hated to do but was very pivotal to my career was that if anybody said, oh, wow, do you know anybody that at CBS that I can talk to? I would be like, oh, yeah, I know somebody, you know what I mean? So I got known for that. And I started to, um, I took her list. And updated, updated, updated. I consolidated. I, um, wow, what else? Just, you know, made sure that you knew who was hired, who was fired, who was receptive to pitches. And I would just provide it for free for my friends and my clients. I did that for like three years in a row. And the list just grew and grew and grew and grew and grew. And, um, it was something that I thought was needed in the marketplace. There are a lot of media services out there that will charge you $100 a month, and there's nobody sitting there updating and verifying that that information that's up there is true. There's no one doing that. You're just paying for a service um, that's not giving you what it is that you need. So my big fat media is a directory of Condé Nest magazines, Hearst magazines, Meredith magazines, uh, business magazines, and Urban. It's five different categories, but it's a list of over 300 editors. And I don't just give you their email addresses. I give you their social media. I show you where they're most active. I give you advice on how to pitch. Um, I give you some really great <laughs> tips on being successful when you're trying to either write for a magazine or get a client into a magazine. And I charge $99 for it. And people are able to, like, click on something, and then, you know, it's immediate. It's a link. You can send an email. You can send a message. And um, people are getting responses. Um, so, yeah, it's just another stream of income that I'm really excited about putting in the marketplace. It's called the Big Fat Media Guide, and, you know, you can find it on DarylandHudson.com. That's my website. No, that's, that's, that's awesome. And so, you guys, the links will be in the description box so you can get that because we, we find, you know, when you go company to company or client to client and you, you're organizing things, you can really grab a lot of information. And you've taken it from, you know, writing to the PR, but also... And I think a lot of times us as consultants and marketing and PR folks, we're using the, the situation right now to build whatever project that is passionate to us. Now, I do not want to call you the Snoop Dogg of Detroit, but you have created the Black Female Millionaires in Cannabis, and that has been chosen for the South by Southwest for 2020. So I'm just going to assume that you partake or have a love of cannabis and i'm in seattle where you can get a contact high on a, a good day bad day cold day whatever but talk about how you got, you got it smoking in seattle i didn't smoke in seattle 
I mean, it's on every corner and it's right next to the churches, especially the black ones, the few black ones they have, they make sure to put them there since they've gentrified the neighborhood. But <laughs> are you serious? I are kid, you serious? I Wait, kid, they got the next to the churches? Next door to the church. It used to be a big thing and now everyone's kind of calmed down because this is passive Seattle. But right next door, like the same parking lot share. <laughs> And and only so to the black know, ones. You know who's directly responsible for that, though, right? Um, I I I have my assumptions, and I've heard things here. It's the city council. It's the city council. That that is one. Our and I say this, and, and with all love, our weeds are in the state of Washington as a black woman who actually goes to that church. So, um, city, oh, we, well, you know exactly who's responsible for this, yeah, yeah. And she's the most powerful woman in Washington. And for my last six months here in Washington, I choose not to bark up any wrong trees because she's doing the best that she can with what she has. But yeah, and she, she just billions of dollars off that. You know how much money she making? Well, I hate she, to say that, but it's yeah, so she. True. She had money. She had money, um, but before, and she just made more. But it is what it is, and you know, um, to, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. It, it, I was looking at a map. I went to an event last night, uh, a Michigan event. That um, it was a cannabis event. They invited me to go out, and they were showing this map of the United States and how many states were. Uh, medical, uh, medical and recreational. It's only like uh, three states that have not passed the law. Only three. And, and, and so every other state in the United States has passed a medical marijuana law or medical and recreational marijuana law. And we're talking about just in the last five years, just how widespread. And even when I lived in South Africa last year, South Africa had just passed the medical marijuana law. So this thing ain't stopping no time soon. It's just insane. It's like, what are they going to do with cocaine? Are they going to, I mean, I don't know. Let me stop. Let me be quiet. No, 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 no. Keep, keep, keep talking. And I want AL to jump in because, and I'm going to let AL divulge whatever he wants, but AL took a trip. AL slipped in the cut. Yeah, AL took a trip, and if he would, he took a trip to Jamaica, um, and he was the one. I'm going to say it, just in case AL doesn't have to say it. Let me just say my, what AL taught me. Oh, let's that, talk about it. Yeah, that Jamaica could actually, there was something in the law, I don't know if they passed it, but Jamaica could legally send cannabis to South Africa, which was a crazy thought to me, because you can't even send cannabis to between states and but hey i'm gonna let you go on and i'm gonna shut up <laughs> you well uh when when i was uh there this was probably this 2020 now this is going on almost four years ago um and when i was there they had just started the process to um make cannabis legal in jamaica i mean it was like so <laughs> fr- that's funny right hmm? i said yeah that's funny go ahead Make, uh, make, make cannabis legal in Jamaica. Yeah, because, like, I mean, they, they understand it, you know, being a very, um, uh, being a, a resource that could, you know, generate a lot of money. It's, like, it's, it's so rough economically um, outside of, like, the, uh, the affluent areas that, you know, the powers that be, you know, see how it could be uh, helpful. Um, but because it was so new, um, when I went down there, it I was looking at it as a, like a business opportunity. Um, I'm not sure where they are now, but yeah, I was trying to bridge the gap between Africa and, and Jamaica, because if you start to like really peel back the layers and understand like the geographics and the, um, uh, the environment of, you know, some of these tropical places, these Caribbean places, um, you can start to see and understand why the cannabis coming out of these places would be, um so much better than let's say a united states or even stuff that's grown chemically just based on the minerals that's coming out of the ground and the sunlight and the water so forth and so on well yeah that's what they were saying a lot of why south africa is plentiful is because 
of the climate, you know, these places that are, well, you know, the United States, I guess, is they're making, they're manufacturing a lot of processed cannabis. So I don't think the THC is going to be as strong. But I think, I think it's kind of dope that other countries are, um, you know, they're claiming, they're claiming what it, what it is that's theirs and they're making a profit from it, like the cocoa people. And the Ivory Coast in, in Ghana saying, we're going to tax cocoa because you're getting all that cocoa. We're going to make it more expensive. I think that's kind of cool. Oh, but yeah. uh, it'd, be great if Jamaica, it'd be great if Jamaica and Africa could say, hey, we got the best wheat in the world. And this is what it's going to cost to get the seed. <laughs> well, well, well check, check this out, Daryl. And to kind of piggyback on that, I want to say maybe like a year, no, maybe two years ago, um, you know, the, the word is definitely getting out about. Um, exploration of um, other countries in terms of their cannabis um, to the point where uh, Vice, they did a story um, a little while ago about sending a crew out or following this crew rather. These guys were going in like the deep, the deep, deep uh, jungle and forests of Congo and they were finding these really exotic strains um and it's some some of these people on on this team they were following they were so ambitious and so gung ho about finding this uh this like this gold cush so to speak that they were risking risking their lives getting malaria and dying in order to bring yeah. some bring some of this stuff back in order to um in order to test and uh where they last left off on the story was that um you know some of what they found they were sending uh to certain laboratories and um they pretty much alluded to um some of the, the chemists that they were working with um being able to isolate uh certain parts of the plant um so you know how you know uh, cannabis has been associated with making people hungry um reverse engineering it so that um cannabis can make uh suppress appetite Oh, make you feel full, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's what some of the stuff they were they were talking about with some of this new um new cannabis they were finding. But like, I mean, it's, oh, yeah. it's really really interesting stuff. Um, and I don't think that you know, I mean, like honestly, I think going to South, living in South Africa for the year that I did was both the blue pill and the red pill because once you are made aware, that was another thing that really. Working for Italian Vogue really opened my mind to the international market because you hear about, you know, you hear the word international and you're like, yeah, but especially if you live in New York or in LA, which are really encompassing cities, right? You really don't think, but once you're able to experience out of the country and working for Italian Vogue and just communicating with those editors really allowed me to um, think outside of America. And I just think it's amazing because. My daughter now has that mentality, and she doesn't want to stay here, which is cool, but um, <laughs> it's very sad at the same time because she's 11, and she's always saying, she's already saying that she wants to live in another country. But um, what, what the reason that I got into cannabis is because um, very often I get magazines, startup magazines, startup. The reason that I was able to go to South Africa is uh, a startup network um, that was owned by an executive at 20, 21st Century Group invited me to um, start, a, start a media department at a new network in South Africa. I had put it out in the world that I wanted to move and I was interested in, in Africa, South Africa specifically because I thought it would be le less traumatic for my daughter. Um, it'd be more modern. And uh, an, an executive at 21st Century that I had met years ago at some conference reached out to me on LinkedIn. And he and I had like a year long conversation. Cause he was like, oh, I want to start a network. And I'm like, yeah, right. So if I have to start a network, I'm gonna get you to start the media department. And that's exactly what he did. Within a year, he had raised enough money and uh, he started a network in South Africa. And a lot of the content we were doing was replications of what was successful here but um what was really just amazing is how we saw uh, their through their eyes the perception of america 
so uh, it's, it's important. It's so, 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 so important that we continue to tell these stories because, you know, a million people are storytellers. But, um, you know, the biggest voices are the biggest ones are the ones that are heard. Um, and you don't want to be known in other countries as dumb or stupid or lazy or any of those things when you hustle and grind it every single day. So they're not seeing the entrepreneurs like us over there. They're just not, you know. <laughs> they're seeing Jay-Z, Beyonce. They think everybody's rich. Everybody got it made. Everybody's lazy. Money is flowing out of the trees. You know, that's. Africa's perception of America. So I'm sure it's the same way in other countries. But um, yeah, when I got back to America, uh, another publication by the name of Cincy, they were out of Colorado. They were a cannabis lifestyle publication. And the same thing, hey, can, we're, we're starting a magazine. Can you come and be an editor and kind of bring some diversity to what we're doing? We're very whitewashed. We're talking about cannabis. but we want to be more lifestyle driven and you're in Detroit and can you kind of launch a magazine and take the helm of it? And I was like, yeah, sure, sure. So that's what got me into cannabis. And I've met some amazing people that a whole bunch of people don't know about. And, um, you know, when you talk about when you read in the media, black and cannabis, it's always, you know, get people out of jail or all oh, the challenges, blah, blah, blah. I've been I've been meeting the actual opposite. Everybody that I know in the weed game is living in fat houses, like uh, driving fat cribs. Um, so yeah, I'm like, okay, these are the stories that I want to tell, and uh, I think a lot of people are listening. Wow. So I yeah, I pitched a um, I pitched the South by Southwest. They said yes. So we're getting, we're getting, we're getting like, we roll in like five deep to Austin. Which, which is? <laughs> in March. <laughs> which now everyone who knows you is going to say, can I stay in your room? Because you know, those rooms out at South. Well, okay, okay. Like, I have to tell you, <laughs> I have to tell you, and I'm not promoting them, but I have to tell you about this dope hotel that we're staying. It's called the Otis. It's after Otis Redding, and it's a new hotel in Austin. They open in February and they curate a soundtrack for your stay. It's dope as hell. Um, we're saying there. Netflix is not Netflix. Oh, oh shoot, I shouldn't have said that. But uh, we're working with A and E to do a Sunday brunch with the Clock Sisters. Clock Sisters, because you know the Clock Sisters are coming out coming out on Lifetime, and you know they're from the D, so they reached out to me. So. It's a lot going on. And honestly, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, Kellen, a lot of the opportunities that I get now, because I'm a woman of a certain age, people call and want to work with me. And I think that's, that's, like, that's a pretty good life, you know? I don't do shit that I don't want to do. If it's some bullshit, I'm not going to do it. And it's talking about, you know, talking degrading women, degrading black people, you know, not just it's like, when my friends said Queen of People wasn't involved, I immediately said, I don't think I want to go after the Queen with Eve because she doesn't have a good reputation in making good movies. And it's not that I'm downing her. I'm just deciding that I don't want to fuck with it. And that... So I like being in the position that I'm in. <laughs> and, and that's a good position to be in. Um, it's Brent, a blessed. It's a yeah. blessed position. Yeah, but you gotta, you gotta put 25 years in. Yeah, yeah, and and a lot of folks aren't willing to, and they'll fall off, and they, you know, they want to be the artist today and and not put in the time. But talk about, you know, going to Africa. Was that just a year contract, or for me, I'm Mister Africa. You you see it on the social media. Any chance I get, can I take a, take a family? Okay, <laughs> so there was no way you. It was could a year contract. Yeah, it was a year contract, and I just I lose so much money that I wish I still had right now, but I, me and my daughter just like blew it out. <laughs> we lived fast, we had a maid, we had a show. I mean, have you been to South Africa? Yes, yes I have. Okay, so you know, everybody has maids, everybody has drivers. That's all know. of Africa. 
All, all of Africa, if you're, yeah, if you're around affluent people, and that just means they have a job. I mean, you know, they have two well, or three. Yeah, I mean, you are you are really shamed if you're making a regular salary and you don't hire somebody. They shame you. So <laughs> we we was having days. We had a pool. We come back to America. We like damn. Yeah. We well, no, we gotta fuck with snow now. <laughs> And, and, and I think, and, th and that's why I was asking, because I think the perception um, until recently with the year return, everyone and Black Panther, people thought, you know, Africa this, Africa that. And they never believed me when I would say, no, life is actually right. better there. Wakanda is real. We got a lot of work, but still, can you imagine? I mean, seriously, I don't mean to go off on a tangent, but can you really imagine if everybody was woke like you in Africa? We, we'd all be there at least six months on, six months off, given our, our circumstances, because you only need $3,000 a month in, in Africa to be rich. Um, everything is going to be, you know, paid for with $3,000 a month. So I remember taking a client out there and he said, what? And he was like, think of all the money that, he makes. But, but like, all you need is like 1500 15000 rand, and you are good to go. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah. I saw when I people that ran for the money, and then when I see how people salivate over American dollars, I was like, "What the? What is going on?" It, and and with yeah. and with that, um, I I want to, you know, before I don't before we wrap up, I want to get into the, um, you've done this for twenty plus years. I I've done this. People say, Kelly, you've been doing this since I've known you in high school, whatnot. I'm like, whatever you want to say, right? But it's, again, for me, it's all relationship-based. Things kind of fall into God has really blessed me. They say he blesses babies and fools, especially whichever one I am. I've been been blessed to always kind of get something. But I also have other businesses that um, I do do that are passionate to me, like writing books and whatnot. But how have you continue to make a living. You talk about your daughter. How hard has that been for you? Because we find a lot of people quitting or, you know, always complaining about the money they don't have in our field. What have you done to sustain yourself? Well, like I said earlier, is be inventive and expand outside of print journalism. I mean, I've made I have made a living off of print journalism. And I have honestly made a living off of black print journalism. Um, print magazines have afforded me to really travel around the world. I am not living on six figures by no means, but I'm doing pretty good on five, you know? <laughs> I didn't really start making like really, really good money until I started producing my own events, until I started bringing people together. Um, this was very profitable for me. And um, also this this uh, directory that I created, and that I'm not se now selling this ebook that I'm putting together, um, that was very profitable for me. That that allowed uh, Nia and I to really like take off for a whole year. I was getting paid a salary in South Africa, but I mean I didn't work in America for, for a whole year, you know. And I was still paying rent here. I was still paying taxes. I was still paying all of those bills. But I did not have a job. I did not have a client, an American client, for an entire year. I would have never thought I was able to do that. But going to South Africa allowed me to, you know, make money without even really working. So the book kind of afforded me to pay all of my American bills while I lived in South Africa. So I have, you know, again, if I can offer any advice, um, you have to continually evolve or you have to continually, I mean, I don't, I don't see myself as, as 50, 60, 70, really working as hard as I work now. I actually work less now that I worked last year. I work less now than I worked two years ago. And eventually I'll only be working like one day a week. But um, I, I do, I really do have to evolve. and I. Um, my daughter plays a really big role in that because she opens my eyes to a lot of things that I would have never thought about. 
Um, the people that I'm surrounded by, I keep them very tight. I keep keep those conversations sharp, and I I constant want constantly want feedback so that I'm better. Um, because if I lose my faculties, I lose my mind, or I'm not able to work, or I get lupus or MS or something, I still have to have money coming in. So, um, you know, it's kind of like setting yourself up for success. And I realized that, um, yeah, selling a product, um, building a brand, all of those things are important because you you can't work, you can't work a twenty four seven all the time. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I don't. I, I used to be. I used to be. Um, oh, I work all the time. I don't sleep. But now that I'm inching up to fifty, I'm just like, shit. I can't keep uh, doing that. I got a kid. I want to spend time with her. I got older parents. I want to spend time with them. I don't want to constantly go to red carpets, have events, be on calls all day. You know, I don't want to do all of that. So, yeah, my advice is. Be creative. Be as freaking creative as you possibly can. Even if you're an accountant going to an accountant job every day, you literally can have one client and be rich. You just got to be strategic on who that one client is. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, Daryl, um, we're 16 days oh. into 2020. Uh, how are things shaping up for you this year? Um, is it a is it a piggyback on last year? Uh, what is what are some of the things you're looking forward to in 2020? Um, I'm creating more products this year. I'm definitely doing more ebooks because I understand the importance of making money while you sleep. Um, I want to win some awards this year. I've been doing this for 25 years. I haven't really won. I've, I've gotten some accomplishments, but I want to win some awards. I want to tell bigger stories. Um, and I find I find a lot of pleasure in educating. So I'm looking for more opportunities to really educate. And it's important, a lot of my, especially my mentor, you know, he always says, stop giving away advice for free. But I can spend one hour on the phone with a young PR publicist that's got a client that's really challenged and just motivate her and give her some really good tools. And I can get so much satisfaction out of that. And I know this what makes me happy. And helping people really make me happy. So I would love to do like some journalism classes, more mentorship for sure. But that comes with age. You know, with age, you want to start teaching, you want to start teaching folks. So I'm involved and I'm getting older. So I want to keep getting older shit. <laughs> Uh, totally dig, totally dig. That's, that's, yeah, that's 2020, stay alive. <laughs> well, there you have it. Um, and then to, uh, and the, teach some folks up, teach some folks up, yeah. Uh, so the picture. So I do, I do want to ask, um, can I, can I ask you some questions off air before, before we get off the interview? Can I, can I hit you up just a few minutes? I want to ask you about you. Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Um. So, so um. Yeah. Please, please mention the book one more time, and we'll talk about South by Southwest. But yeah, those are that's me in a nutshell. <laughs> that's definitely what's up. That's definitely <laughs> um. Like with uh, as we begin to wind this uh this conversation down, because we like to think of uh all our guests and features here in Diversified Game, uh, the, the talks that we have, you know, these are all conversations. Um, but what we do like to do is to peel the layers back um, with the teaching that you've done, uh, with the extensive amount of context you've built, you know, based off of credibility and rapport. Um, one thing that's uh, important to us, and we like to know what's important to you uh, are there any uh, community causes that really touch your heart? Um, is there anything that you'd like to give back? Um, and would you mind speaking upon those things? Well, yeah, I would love to. I don't really like to talk about it publicly because it's really no one's business. But thank you for asking because I think that's um, that's something that I don't really get a chance to talk about. And it's always sexual assault, not only because I have a daughter, but I've been experienced to want 
to sexual assault. I think so many of my friends have. Um, and it's, it's, it's a cause that I'm very passionate about. I had a, uh, my first experience, I had a line sister. I pledged Delta Sigma Theta back in Stoneman College, and one of my line sisters was killed by her boyfriend. And we found out, you know, later that she had been abused the whole time she was with him, and we were just, you know, so stupid. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I just spent a lot of time there. There um, are some organizations here uh, I, that I do through Delta Sigma Theta, but sexual assault to me is one of my passions, and I'm I I really get excited about um, telling those stories, not just the assault stories, but um, the stories of rebuilding. You know, it's it's one thing to talk about the challenge, but it's another thing to talk about the rebuilding. So there are no plans right now of any specific launches. But to answer your question, that is always a subject of mine that uh, is near and dear to my heart, especially since I have an 11-year-old. Yes, and with that, especially with women, my, my two daughters, London and Sydney dot com, I call them. That's their website. The all, all children, all girls especially, should be in a martial arts. I choose jujitsu because there's no better place for a woman to learn how to dominate anybody while on her back, while they're in between her legs. And so, you know, that that's something that oh, so should I take Nia out of out of her hip hop class? Cause she loved that damn hip hop. My my hip-hop question. Hip hop ain't saving her life, right? Yeah, to to me, it, it it's not. Um, you know, we we've done ballet and we do swimming. Swimming and jujitsu are not even. I mean, those aren't even options because you can't drown on my watch. And I, um, I always say because jujitsu is expensive. Um, it, where where we do with the Gracie Bada. But I say it's cheaper than therapy, and it gives a certain confidence that, you know, when you see them taking down boys and, and people bigger than them when they started on their back, I just know that that could have, um, that could have um, you know, helped a lot of women just knowing what to do. Because it's just practical what to do and, you know, break an arm, leg, eye gouge, all that good stuff. But to me, all the dance... <laughs> Yeah, all, all, all the all the dance stuff is so optional. Push it, push it, push it. I know that's right. I know that's right. Yeah, Hel- helps the daddy sleep at night, especially when he goes on, you know, um, for work and, and goes out. So to me, cheerleading and all all those dance things sounds good, but how many people are professionals at that that started at eight? And what did it really help with your life? And I just, you know, again. To, uh, my girls want to do dance even more, but first let's dance on this mat real quick. I say, well, you can take me down. Yeah, yeah. No, I do. Nia swims too. We do, but it's a physical activity that she loves. And I know the teacher, but you're right. The karate, the jujitsu, because she needs the, uh, it's the mind. It's the mind thing. And I think a lot of that allows her to be still. And anything that allows them to be still and think is good in my book. Yes. It's good well, well, we, we, you gave the game today on how to make it as a professional writer. Folks, all her information is in the description box. If you do hit her up and say, hey, I'm looking for a job. Can you hook me up? Could you then understand all the 20 years of experience and that she then has to put on her consultant hat? So, you know, ask her what her fee is for teaching and also you know have bought her media big fat media guide prior so you can show that you're just not one of those people with their hand out you actually are caring about what she's pushing and not just looking for a position so we are going to sign off and we will talk after this but i thank you for giving the game today thank you so much i appreciate it it was fun thank all you. right thank you. Y'all be blessed.